Adam Conover, creative, creator of the comedy and journalism show Adam Ruins Everything, is alleging that Time Warner censored one of his episodes while in negotiations with AT&T about a potential merger. Conover explained to the head of the antitrust enforcement at the Department of Justice that the single time he was censored by the network was when he did an episode on, quote, monopolistic consolidation in the cable industry because Time Warner was scared it would anger AT&T and jeopardize the merger. Joining us now to discuss is research director for the American Economic Liberties Project and author of Goliath, Matt Stoller. Welcome, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So, uh, you know, tell us more uh, about this story and, and why you, uh, you know, why you wanted to, to highlight it. What is it, you know, what is the lesson here? Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion about disinformation and censorship and whatnot. And I, I think there's a lot there. People want to say that the corporations want to help the left or the right or neither or both. But really, dominant firms use censorship all the time. They just use it to help themselves. And I thought this was a good story about that. Uh, but there are a lot of other examples of this problem. Well, what did the censorship in this case actually look like? Yeah, so what Adam says is that there was an episode which was where, which he did. Uh, so his show is a comedy journalistic show, and he talked about Adam, his, the episode was Adam Ruins the Internet, which was about how cable companies sort of screw you. And when they were in discussion with the merger, Time Warner pulled that episode from reruns and streaming because they were afraid that it would for AT&T during the merger. But there's other examples of this um, that I highlighted. You know, in 2008, Comcast refused to run a political ad in the Philadelphia or Pennsylvania area um, that uh, criticized a candidate for doing something that would help Comcast on surveillance. And Comcast was an important player in that area, so a lot of voters didn't get to see that ad. Um, Facebook routinely censors for on its own behalf, so not for the right or the left, but you know, Sheryl Sandberg got a Daily Mail story killed the other, this was reported a couple weeks ago by the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. because it made her look bad. And in 2009, Mark Zuckerberg actually deleted entirely a large uh, Facebook group, hundreds of thousands of users, called Facebook Users Against the New Terms of Service. They were opposed to excessive surveillance, and Mark Zuckerberg just got rid of them. And the reason this matters, the, what what takes something in and says, oh, well, it's just a newspaper choosing not to run something in an editorial choice versus censorship, is dominance, right? If you're, if there are a lot of newspapers, if there are a lot of social networks or whatever, and one of them won't run something, then that's editing. But if there's one, or if it's a major uh, player in our cultural commons, then editing kind of bleeds into censorship. And what Adam Codover was saying is that because of merger policy, because we don't really enforce antitrust anymore, the, you know, there used to be a broad spectrum of TV networks and entertainment venues and distributors. And today there, there are six, right? And there are, mer there are rumors that there are gonna be mergers of those. So there's just less and less ability to have free expression because, you know, when you don't have many firms um, controlling the flow of information, then inherently their editorial choices become censorship choices. And we know that corporations censor to protect their own bottom line. Yeah, I recently interviewed uh, Bernie's uh, deputy campaign manager, Ari Rabenhoff, about his new book. And there's a story in there, it was new to me, that the Senate office, Bernie's Senate office, had sat down with Facebook after the algorithm changes really notably depressed their reach. And in the course of that conversation, Facebook apparently told them that they should basically delegate how they message as a Senate office to Facebook in order to get around the al algorithm, basically taking uh, the, the letting Facebook take the lead about what the, the uh, uh, an elected senator's messaging <laughs> actually is in order to beat the the restrictions that they put on. And there's no recourse, of course, right? Like that is the whole problem is that you're dealing with these individual um, massive platforms and there's not a lot you can do in terms of competing somewhere else when everybody you're trying to reach is is a one place to that end i wonder what you make of the elon musk buying twitter are you optimistic that it will kind of increase uh, democracy as some people think or do you think there's a, a, an opportunity because it is a private company i know he says it's going to take it pri uh, public again but because it is private that some of these abuses might um, be exacerbated yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think the problem with social media is it's just regulated in a particular way that incentivizes people to fight with each other. Because like what these firms are doing is they're trying to map 
optimize the amount of time you spend and the amount of data they can harvest so that they can addict and they want to addict you so that they can either charge you money or um, or sell advertising. And it's a it's a it's a fundamental problem uh, with the business model and the regulatory choice that we've chosen. Um, in terms of Musk, I mean, look, the guy's owned by the Chinese government, right? I mean, he's he just opened his second plant of Tesla in in Shanghai. Uh, the Ch the Chinese authorities uh, locked down everything in Shanghai, but except for the Tesla factory. He's the richest man in the world because of the Chinese government. And no one's mm -hmm. talking about this because, you know, it's the right that is the, that are the China hawks and they like Elon Musk doing this for their own cultural reasons. Um, and then the left doesn't really want to get at China and they want to talk about disinformation or whatever nonsense they're, they care about. But like the Chinese government is very serious about controlling global discourse. And I worry that if you put the control of a major, um, you know, it's bad enough that there's TikTok, right? Right, I was going to say. control of Twitter. <laughs> yeah. The, the yeah. worst, yeah, the, the, right, the, the worst yeah. case scenario has already happened. The most popular social media site is even more directly controlled uh, by, by China. And that, you know, that to me is a clear, so, you know, with the censorship terminology, I think it does get tricky. And I, I'm as guilty of this as anyone of, of using kind of the word censorship to describe uh, some uh, social media moderation decisions that I don't like. And I think it's, it's certainly fair to call it censorship when decisions are being made at the behest, uh, either because it's been explicitly ordered by a government or in order to appease a government like the Chinese government. But that, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum to this, right? Because, I mean, if I, if I opened this show every day with like a diatribe against rising, I'd probably be fired. I don't think we'd call that <laughs> censorship, really. It would be, I mean, I, I would, but no one, like that would be an unreasonable thing to call it. Um, you know, so somewhere in between are these, you know, YouTube changing policies that we think are bad for discourse, that we criticize. I don't know if it's quite censorship. It might just be bad. Um, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of, of decisions and, you know, how, what we think it should be described. Does, that, does any of that resonate with you? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And the way I would draw the line is I would just say it's about scale and market power, right? So Rising isn't the only show on YouTube, for example. Um, and so when you guys, whatever you do is, it's just an editorial choice. And I think that's true for, you know, most out publishing outlets, they don't have any market power, but we're talking about, you know, YouTube itself, that is a, essentially a monopoly over video on the internet. Yeah, there are other kind of, there are other platforms, but they don't reach huge portions of the internet. So if YouTube were to make a change, then you're bleeding into corporate censorship versus versus just an editorial decision. And that's what we see with things like Facebook. And that is why Mark Zuckerberg, for example, put together a kind of a Supreme Court type of arrangement for content moderation, right? And mm. they were explicitly mm. modeling it on the Supreme Court, right? So they recognize there is governing capacity here. So I don't actually make, I think the one area I disagree with is I don't think it's just about government. I think it's about these private governments and what makes a private government market power. Like it's really simple. If you, if there really isn't an alternative, then you have coercive governing power. And a lot of private entities have coercive governing power at this point in the economy um, and in our speech you know, commons. Like for example, if Amazon doesn't sell your book, hmm. you ain't selling your book, right? I mean, that, that's, you know, if you, can't, if you can't get one of the six firms that do streaming that control now basically all entertainment, you can't get them to, to actually put your video up. And if your video covers certain subjects, you won't be able to get them, then sorry, but you're, you don't have free speech. And I think that's what we're talking about here is, you know, when you have market power, it becomes censorship versus when you don't, it's just editing. So Matt, what then are the antitrust interventions that people who are concerned about this should be pushing for? I think breaking up firms uh, that have dominant market power, if you can, would be helpful. So if there were, say, 10 search engines that people used versus just one general search engine versus just one, then that one search engine would be much less important. Um, and, you know, there are other provisions you could make for, uh, for, for network systems. I think breaking up the streaming services both, you know, saying you can make content or you can distribute content, but you can't do both. That's what we, that's the way we used to work. So that would open up, like that would create sort of these open markets where, where 
distributors would have to bid over the sort of the more creative stuff versus just end to end control. Um, and then, you know, there are certain regulations that you can put in place to make sure that, you know, that there is, uh, there's when you have network systems that you can't break up because they're just, they're, you know, they're network systems, uh, then rules to ensure that there's some level of neutrality in how they operate, things to tamp down on the amplification of content, on the pro profits from data and advertising. I think you can like, you know, m make, you know, what you want to aim for is uh, like a telecom network. Like when I call you, I have T-Mobile, I call you on, you know, T-Mobile doesn't care what I say. They just charge me money. And, you know, sometimes they charge me too much, but like, they don't try to censor because their business model doesn't doesn't matter what I what I say. Um, and that's kind of where you want to get to. Uh, so where you can break these institutions up, you should. And where you can't because the, the network system, the value is having the network system, mm -hmm. then you should try to create a model where um, where it's it's neutral and and they don't make money depend, you know, based on manipulating what you say. I think that's such an important point that it's, it is the advertising uh, model, the fact that they are making money on driving clicks as opposed to us just picking up the phone and communicating to but each other. That's what other. allows the service to be free though, right? I, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to pay, if this is a, like a subscription model for these services, then it's better that it's, mm -hmm. Facebook is, is make, right, makes money selling just, uh, several of the things you, you just mentioned, the, the curated advertising experience. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know. I, I don't think I would want to pay. I, I wouldn't want the kind of customer service and and uh, and experience and the cost of like uh, of, of my internet service provider, or my cable company. Well, Matt, what do you say to Disastrous. that? Disastrous. Well, well, look. If if people are not willing to pay for social media, look, people have paid for goods and services for thousands of years. It's the most basic business model. If people don't want to pay money for something, like you're paying for Facebook or or social media, and you're paying with your attention, your time, your data, and they're just sort of pretending that you're not. And so if you don't wanna, if, if they're not willing to explicitly say, here's what it costs you, uh, and instead they wanna like on the back end steal your Saturday night, like, or you know, you sit down and you're like, oh, I'll just go on YouTube for a second and then your Saturday night's gone. That's a way of paying. I just think that they should be honest about the cost and if people are not willing to put money into it, then it, the product should, you know, that's, they shouldn't, it yeah. Exist. Also, I, I think, do think it's overstated because Facebook, at the end of the day, was started by a 21, a 20 year old college student for free in 2004. And the question I don't think is whether or not Facebook would exist if not for them being going to make gobs of money off of selling our data. It's whether or not it would be the billion dollar company it is and whether it needs to be, whether that's a socially beneficial outcome. Thank you so much for talking to us today, uh, Matt. This has been edifying. Can I just say one last thing? Sure. Just so so. One thing that is happening that is good is there is a merger in the book publishing industry between Penguin and Simon and Schuster, which is a, exactly an example of these oligopolies that control speech. Right. This mm. is books, and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division is challenging that merger partially on the basis that there are diversity and speech harms here. So there is actually something you know that enforcers are doing here, and there's sort of an increasing realization from from people that in government that this is actually a structural problem. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. And next, Democratic Senator Patty Murray has told PBS that the Senate will vote next week on a bill to codify abortion and make it legal in every state. We'll discuss that coming up.